Thank you, Mark. Uh, I noticed that you included your opening remarks by saying you had given yourself a title and then you had not spoken to it. I think I'm going to do a bit of the same. Not, not I hope, uh, perhaps quite as uh, extensive an overview of things that, that he did. But nevertheless, I'm going to speak widely. Um, but first, in fact, what authority do I, to ha do I have, if any, to talk to you about these, these issues? Well, I've been in the European Parliament, which is an interesting political forum, as it is obviously a parliament, but because it's multinational, it also involves a lot of what you might describe as quasi-diplomacy. I've also been a, min a minister in the English Culture Ministry, which is now the Department of Culture, Media and Sport. And when I was a minister there, it was called the Department of National Heritage. And as Mark said, I also chair a body called the Reviewing Committee on the Export of Works of Art, which is the body that sifts and occasionally concludes that works of art are national treasures to our country and perhaps should not be exported, even if the owner wishes them to take them outside of our own <coughs> jurisdiction. Uh, I'm not going to go into that in great de detail, but suffice it to say some countries, for example, the United States, have really no rules about this. Other countries, for example, Italy, have very, very severe and strict and rigid rules about this. And we in this country, in the UK, are somewhere in the middle. Now, part of the political work when I was the government deputy chief whip in the House of Lords was to act as the second and the junior <coughs> foreign office minister in the second chamber of parliament. And so that is what the only slight contact I've ever had, other than through relations who've been involved <coughs> professionally, with diplomacy. And it seems to me that it is important to realize that diplomacy in the modern world is something very different from which it was in the traditional uh, times of the 18th, well, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. Diplomacy uh, really goes back to the Re Renaissance period and the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, when the framework of really the Western world from that time up until I would suggest quite recently was established. The thing about diplomacy is there was a, a well-known, no doubt mythical story about the British diplomat who defined diplomacy as going abroad and lying for your country. <laughs> Don't think it's probably ever been quite as simple as that, although there have been some quite uh, sophisticated practitioners of that school over the years, both in Britain and elsewhere. We're living now in a completely different sort of world, a world of networks. After all, and if you think about it, about it in that context, there is hardly a nation in the world that in some way or other doesn't have some kind of networked relationship with its neighbours. The, the, the role of the embassy as a gatekeeper for, for, for commercial, for political and other reasons into other countries has broken down and dissolved. And embassies are very different sorts of places from what they used to be. No longer are ambassadors plenipotentiaries. No longer can an ambassador in an obscure part of the globe declare war on the path of his country against another one. It's history, that. It used to happen in the 19th century. They were left to their own devices because there was no real means of communicating with them. And so an ambassador operated in very many ways, almost as a kind of freestanding prime minister at an arm's length from his own government doing what he wanted on behalf of his country. That's history. Now embassies are much more uh, an outpost of the domestic civil service. As I said in my opening remarks, I worked in, in, the, European Un in the European Parliament uh, as part of the European Union institutions for 10 years. And what was very interesting, but hardly surprising if you think about it, was the fact that the British embassy in, uh, in, to the European Union was essentially... Uh, an extension of Whitehall. They had telephones, they had internet links, and it was frankly as easy to talk to the people back in London as it was to the people in the joining room. This has changed the way in which international relations are carried out. And as I said equally, no longer are embassies kind of portals into other countries. There's direct contact in the free world 
on a whole multitude of fronts between interests, and I use that word deliberately, in this country uh, with their opposite numbers elsewhere. And of course, the effect of this is that we're all diplomats now in a whole variety of different ways. We are all representatives of a variety of things in this world, one of which is the countries to which we belong. Now, against that background, and it's as true in the commercial world as it is in the political world, as in all kinds of other spheres of activity, what people want to do is get their interests promoted. They want their perspective on whether it's a commercial transaction or a political development to succeed. And the trick at being successful, at the risk of stating the very, very obvious, is to try and gain the sympathy and understanding of your interlocutor, both on a kind of personal level and also for the argument, for the case, for the proposition that you're trying to advance. And in order to do that successfully, you've got to be clear about how you should present your case. And one of the things that is very interesting is the way in which an argument may be advanced at home, and the one that is considered to be the most convincing and plausible way of putting it forward, is not necessarily going to be the one that is successful with another audience. And we've all known that a little bit of that in our own private lives. You put a spin on things in order to try and take things forward. Now, a very good example of this, uh, if you look at the current debate in this country about membership of the European Union, the way in which aspects of the European Union are debated within Britain are, if translated verbatim to any other part of the European Union, absolutely guaranteed to ensure that Britain's influence is reduced to a minimum. The way in which the arguments about the European Union are advanced within the UK and the, and the arguments and the, 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 the kind of future roadmap that some people would like to see are put forward are guaranteed to it reduced to the lowest possible level, in my view, the chances of being successful. And the reason for that is because they have been put forward without any consideration uh, for the interests and the uh, context of the people to whom they're being addressed. This was very, very obvious to me at an early stage when I was a member of the European Parliament because you're in a multilateral um, assembly and you're trying to advance particular perspectives. And in order to do that successfully, you've got to build up alliances of people to come with you. And the way in which you do that successfully is to try and understand what their preoccupations and priorities are and develop your arguments within the framework of what they think is important. And equally, for two years when I was in the Department of National Heritage, I used to carry out our, our country's business in the Council of Ministers. Precisely the same considerations apply. So that you try, without being silly about it, and it's a slightly trite way of putting it, to be understanding and agreeable to the other people involved. You need to know what their priorities are. Sometimes, politically, you want to give on something that doesn't matter very much to you, in order to create a, a, a negotiating uh, advantage in respect of something that is important to you. And uh, I happen to think that the way in which we run our domestic politics is not designed to make the British political classes good operators at a European and often at an international level. There are, of course, a number of very obvious exceptions to that. But basically, we aren't, I don't think, as a nation, very good at it. Now, as I said, the crucial thing is you need to try and empathise with your audience. And it was very, very obvious to me in the European Parliament because the real difference across Europe, more than anything else, and I didn't expect this to be my conclusion, is the fact that there are, in different countries, people have different educational systems. And if you have different educational systems with different emphases, the result is that people look at problems and their thought processes work in slightly different ways. 
And you then get a kind of paradox that people who frequently have shared values actually, as it were, lay out the arguments in an entirely different way. Now, without wishing to uh, give any offence to anybody here who is Italian, one of the great differences between the Italian education system and the British education system is that we in Britain believe in the merits of being pithy and concise and to the point. And if you are that, that is considered a good way of presenting your arguments. I don't know what you feel about my speech now, and I won't ask you. If you are Italian, it seems to me, by observation, you insult the significance of your subject matter if you're brief. If you don't do all this stuff, you're somehow degrading the proposition that you're trying to develop. So it's no good if you're a British politician in this context approaching an Italian as if he's a Brit. You've got to take more time, more trouble. It's like in the East, you know, you, you can't just go in and do a deal in the bazaar. You've got to take your time and talk about this and talk about that and roll the pitch and, and, and eventually something emerges. The crucial thing is that if you are in the role of the salesman, you've got to decide how to get the deal. The other guy doesn't have to do a deal with you. And this, I think, is where culture is in a more general sense, and I'm touching on some of the things that Mark was saying earlier, is important. Because if I can use a, almost a kind of um, tautologist uh, way of putting it, culture is a kind of lingua franca that goes beyond language. Although obviously, and if you are thinking about the Commonwealth, which is an aspect of, of foreign activities I've had really remarkably little to do with, uh, you start with advantage. The lingua franca across the Commonwealth is English. But if you don't have that link, culture, shared values, shared experiences, shared interests of a whole range, draw people together. Now perhaps it seems to me that the most obvious example of this is music, whether it's classical or whether it's it's pop or jazz, and you were making the point earlier. You don't, it doesn't matter whether you're, you speak French or English or Mandarin, if you understand and are interested in music, it says something to you, <coughs> despite the fact the man <coughs> or woman who wrote it could not express a single thought in your own verbal language. Another example is again which you touched on, which I think is increasingly important. And in the modern world, I think culture has slightly changed its meaning. In the sort of 19th century, high culture, the sort of Kulturkampf, uh, was a relatively narrow, sort of complicated and sophisticated concept, which maybe it's the result of the increased democratization of society, I don't know, has, has, has evolved. And I sometimes criticize people in this country where culture, in, to some, is really a synonym for what you do in your spare time. And I don't think that is what culture is all about. But in the modern world, we all know, not least of all if you're British and you opened any newspaper or looked at any television over last weekend, sport, again, and has the same kind of characteristic as music. Watching, I didn't as it happened, Andy Murray play tennis at Wimbledon, you don't have to, you, it, it's not something that's confined to somebody who speaks English or Serbian, or whatever it happens to be, you can understand what's going on and gain from it. And this is true equally uh, across a whole range of sports, with the possible exception, I dare say, of cricket. Doesn't matter what nationality you are, you can you get pretty quickly understand what it's all about. And then you see there's a kind of coming together, a, a, an affinity, the common bond is built. And in fact, we see this over a whole range of things, whether it's painting, whether it's literature, architecture, film is very important. It's very interesting that, you know, the Americans said in the 30s that Hollywood was the most important instrument of diplomacy they've got because that was selling America. And it was, if you think back, Hollywood in its heyday sold America. And another one which is, again, I think interesting and is, I think, one that's developed in the contemporary world and is food. If you go around London and you look at restaurants that you see here now, they are cosmopolitan to an extent that was unthinkable when I was young. And I live in the north of England, uh, not far from a city called Carlisle, which is not one of the more sophisticated centers of this country. And there is a surprising range of foreign food. And they're all gateways and portals into other people's society. And of course, the paradox at the heart of all this 
is that culture is not something which is nationalist, albeit it is something which may be national. You can be an entirely... Uh, you could be a Brit fighting the Second World War and love Beethoven. There's absolutely no contradiction in that. And what you get then are cross loyalties and cross influences. And for example, I don't know if any of you remember about, I suppose it was toward 10 years ago, the Taliban in Afghanistan blew up the, the big Buddhas, I think they call called the Banyan Buddhas, which was a terrible thing. And that raised an outcry across the world from people who had nothing to do with Afghanistan and had no particular interest in Buddhism because it was such a piece of vandalism that it was thought that it went to the heart of some of the shared things that all of us on the globe enjoy and value. And <laughs> It has an interesting spin, this, that if you live in a, a country which is essentially multicultural, and it is my view that the improvements in the way in which people are able to travel means regardless of immigration rules or anything else, over time, the world in which we live is going to be a world in which every country has, to a greater or lesser extent, a significant presence of people whose cultural roots are not those of the country in which they are currently placed. And in our country, for example, with the traditions from the Indian subcontinent and from the West Indies and elsewhere, we have got, within our own culture, a build-up of multiculturalism, which is absorbed into the uh, wider cultural context of this country. It doesn't happen instantly. It takes time. And if, and, but to be British is going increasingly to mean that we are going to be conscious of and aware of traditions from uh, countries where I have no genetic connection at all. It's happened in the past. The Normans came and uh, ousted the Saxons. Uh, the Huguenots came in the, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, late 17th and early 18th century. Uh, there was the great Jewish diaspora at the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century. We've seen a whole series of these things happening, and it gets absorbed into, the, uh, into ourselves. And in order to retain and create a stable society, we've all got to be open to that both ways round, both the incomers and the uh, people who are there already. In my own case, very interesting, the current debate in this country about possible independence of Scotland. I live 20 kilometres south of the Scots border, and I've suddenly become very conscious of the fact that, for example, the poet Robert Burns or Sir Walter Scott, who come from just over the border, are as part, much part of my culture as they are of Scots culture, and that I resent very much the suggestion that they should be hijacked and taken away from me. I hadn't, didn't think I would like that. Now, against that background, you then have some really quite interesting um, possibilities and, and, and aspects of the politics of culture. And the interesting thing about um, this country is that we are basically, or we pride ourselves, on not being interested in culture. You know, we're a pretty... Uh, Politically, we are a Philistine nation. There are very, very cultivated people in Britain, and you will all know that, but I don't believe that the British perspective on the world has much of an interest uh, in these things. And that is a mistake, in my view, as I shall say in a moment. Now, I was in the um, European Union headquarters the other day, and uh, I picked up this pamphlet which says, Europe, culture matters. I do not believe it is conceivable that a British government would produce a pamphlet with that on the front cover. It is just alien to our general perspective on how these things are. And the fact, one of the differences, particularly around Western Europe, of, between Britain and a number of other, other countries is, and it was touched on, touched on in, well, it's gone now, it's touched on, on, on the, the list that was up there, is this aspect of life is not given the kind of priority in our country. And it has some quite interesting Im implications for both economics, I think, and also identity that it is in a whole number of other European countries. It is, I believe, a, a pity. And you've got to, then, in following on from that, uh, I think, say to yourself, well, one of the characteristics of cultural phenomena, as I've already mentioned, in my view, is that while they may be founded in one country, it doesn't mean that they exclusively belong to it. And the committee that I chair on the export of works of art looks at a whole range of things, one of which is uh, manuscripts. And we quite recently had in front of us 
some papers of Lord Elgin. This is the son of the man who, after whom the so-called the, the Elgin marble stroke Parthenon sculptures are known. And he spent his entire life as a British uh, imperial uh, administrator. He started off as Governor General of Barbados, he then became Governor General of Canada. He then became rather grandiosely uh, titled Viceroy of China, and then he moved on to be Viceroy of India. And he, a lot of his papers were bought by the Canadians because they wanted to put them in their National Library in Ottawa because they referred to and were involved with issues that he'd been working on when he'd been Governor General of Canada. The test that we have in this country as to whether or not we should allow papers out is whether or not they are national treasures by reference to three distinct tests. Now, there is no doubt in my mind, we quite rightly decided these papers were very, very important from a British point of view because they were to do with the British expansion in North America. And so we said, no, we did not think they should be exported because that was, we were answering the question which had been given to us. Subsequently, the Secretary of State, who, in whose hands the final decision rests, decided that they should be allowed to go to Ottawa. And that seems to me to be a very good example of where you've got shared cultural phenomenon. I am not criticizing the Secretary of State for allowing them to go away. I entirely see the point. And the reason we, though, decided that they should, they met the test, which meant they should remain, was because the question we were asked was, are these of British national importance? Ultimately, she had to take a decision balancing the Canadian interest and the British interest and a whole range of other things in between, no doubt. So w w we live in a world where things are shared. And it's this sharing, I think, that puts culture at the center of, in many ways, and using the word in a loose sense, at the center of international relations. Because if you can only strike the right notes, you are going to go a long way towards advancing the things that matter most to you. Equally, and it's in parallel with this, is the interesting phenomenon of the role of tourism. Now, in some ways, mass tourism can hardly be said, said to be a manifestation of culture. On the other hand, if people travel, meet each other, see the great sights of other nations, surely it actually has a beneficial effect in making and helping people understand each other and what their priorities might be. And so, it's, this is something, again, I think in our country, we haven't really got our minds around at all. And of course, as has already been said, so-called soft power, using that word in a very loose sense, rather looser than the way that Mark Donfrey did, is important. The BBC does, amongst other things, very much project the UK to other parts of the world. And interestingly, the converse is true. I remember when I was... Um, in 1989, first in the European Parliament, it was the time the, Euro the, the, uh, Berlin, the Berlin Wall came down. One of the crucial facts that brought the Berlin Wall down was that video footage of riots in Leipzig was smuggled back to the West, which was then uh, transmitted by television back into East Germany. And that proved to the East Germans that what their government was telling them was simply untrue and that there really were, there'd been, there were obviously rumours about what was going on, but you, totalitarian regimes can clamp, it, clamp down on it. This completely took the lid off the tin. And you see the same thing happening in a, in a slightly different way in the, in the response of the Chinese authority to the internet and to satellite television and so on. Once the, the light is, it, it gets in, you can't get it out again. And it's enormously liberating and enabling phenomenon. And if you look round the world, and if you look round the way in which, as a world in, in, in one sort of slightly superficial sense, is getting smaller all the time, the w we countries and people and businesses have to do deals with and negotiate with each other. They have to build up relationships with each other. And it seems to me that the real point of culture in this context of diplomacy and it enables both the individuals and the organizations to be able to go the extra mile because at the end of the day, it's about building confidence and understanding. And if you've got that, you're likely to get a better outcome 
than you will if you don't.